Dear Emmeline, I have strength to move mountains, but cannot move time from present to past. I wish I could speak the words you have read me in the books, words of love and regret and of things lost, but I wish even more I could hear your gentle voice. Instead, I have comforted myself in reading the books you would have read with me, filling my mind and heart with the tales of adventurers, thoughts of great thinkers, and poems of the stars. You have given me a great gift, this love of words, and for that, I am grateful to yours, Gunner. The needle, it gets hotter, Gunner called, startling me from the then and there and returning me to the here and now. Returning the rose-colored book to its place on the shelf, I reached for the black and more masculine-looking Alfred Medical Manual and headed reluctantly back to the main room. Gunner placed the glasses on his nose and thumbed through the pages. Oh, yes, here we are. He moved his lips and muttered words like incision and laceration and coagulation. Then he placed the book face down in his lap as if he might need to refer to it again during the procedure. Have you ever done this before? I asked, my eyes growing wide as Gunner took up the needle. Oh, you bet. I make the stitches one other time. Of course, I was much younger then, just a boy myself. He threaded the needle. It was another boy. His name is Lars. He started a fight with me, saying all manner of mean things, and I punch him in the mouth. His lip, it started to bleed in all over, so I stitch him up good. He'll never say those things again. In fact, I don't recall him saying anything again, his lips sewn up so good. I pulled my head back, but caught Gunner giving early a wink as he set to work on my forehead. I winced and grimaced. If I'd had a bullet to bite on, I might have bitten clear through it. But with a few steady strokes, Gunner had stitched me up good. The wound was throbbing. Early reached into his backpack and unscrewed the lid of a small tin. It was some kind of lavender-scented salve that he gently dabbed on my new stitches. It will ease the pain, said Early. It's really for snake bites, but it should work on stitches, too. Now it is the time to eat lunch. Gunner cleared away the stitching supplies and washed up while Early made himself completely at home and stirred the simmering stew. Gunner took three wooden bowls from the cabinet and spooned out generous helpings. We all sat on stools around the fire and ate for a time in silence. The stew was hot and filled with flavors and spices. I was just wondering what it might be, what might be in it when Early said, Jack, did you know Gunner's missing a toe? I gagged a little on the stew. Gunner, tell Jackie about that time when you went fishing and you caught a sea bass, but when you pulled him out, it was a shark instead, and he bit your toe right off. Remember that? I looked at both of them, Early and Gunner, with my mouth hanging open. <clears throat> it was only lunchtime. How could Early have learned so much of Gunner's life? Yes, I remember, but we'll save that story for later. I'd like to hear how young Mr. Jack is feeling after having a, after having drank half the Kennebec River. A little shaky, I answered, partly because of the stitches and partly because I had bitten down on something I had hoped was a carrot. I still had not heard the fate of Gunner's toe, and my imagination was running wild. That's right, go on now, eat your supper. I was hungry enough, and the meaty broth was so good, I decided to take my chances. So, Gunner continued, Mr. Early tells me you are on a quest. He finished the stew and set the bowl aside. It's really Early's quest, I said, trying to distance myself from Early's crazy notion. I'm just going along. I see, said Gunner, picking up a rabbit skin and using a curved white bone started scraping the inside of the pelt. Just going along? That is what you are doing on the river, too, just going along. He puckered his lips out. You might consider taking a more active role in your pursuits. There was something between a challenge and a chastisement in his voice. Leastways, if you end up in the river again, you'll have the comfort of knowing you played some part in getting yourself there. My face flushed a little at being called out. Yes, sir, I said. I knew what he meant. My mom used to say, if you get caught with your hand in a cookie jar, don't pretend like somebody else reached it in there for you. What is it you do here, exactly? I asked, trying to change the subject, plus the cabin with its array of animal skins and gear begged for explanation. I'm a veterinarian, came his answer. I felt my insides ball up again. He can't be a very good one, I thought looking at the stuffed badger in the corner with its mouth pulled open in an angry snarl, and the raccoon hides that hung from the ceiling. 
Yes, every doctor loses a patient now and then, but how many doctors hang their dead clients from the rafters or have them stuffed on display in the corners of their homes? Gunner let out a slow laugh. I am only fooling with you. I am what they call an outfitter. I have the gear you need for hunting, fishing, trapping, and the like. What about tracking? Early asked without mentioning the great bear. Well now, Gunner pursed his lips together. That can be dangerous. You never know when what you are tracking might be tracking you. Will you outfit us? Early asked. We can pay you. He reached into his nearly empty backpack. Most of our provisions have already been eaten or lost to the pirates. But somewhere in a zippered pocket that Olsen had overlooked was Early's bean tin with a wad of money. Oh, Lord, you two are greener than a couple of cucumbers. You make a big mistake now waving money around like that for anyone to steal. And what business do you have wandering around up here in these woods? He squinted at us. I was afraid Early might say too much. We're just on a nature hike, I said. Oh, sure. Gunner peered over his glasses at me. Well, I suppose you would be better that you prepared or might end up how shall we say, floating up Runamuck River without a paddle? Too many folks roaming around looking for the wrong thing. That's what I think. What do you mean? I asked. If someone's going to come out here, maybe even spend a lot of money on equipment, seems like they'd be pretty sure what they're looking for. And that is where you would be wrong. The ones who are most consumed with their hunt, desperate, you might say, for what they think they are after, it is often a far cry from what they are really after. It is a fact, too, that sometime, that sometime they're not really looking for anything at all, but they are running away from something. His voice was clear and full, as if it came from vast glacial waters where the great whales roam. Like dogs? Early said in his off-the-wall way. Maybe. Gunner breathed in deeply, so deeply that I wondered if he had a blowhole on the top of his head and could hold his breath for long periods of time. But eventually he let the air out in a slow, measured breath. <sniffs> Maybe, he repeated, but sometime what they run from, it just follows them until there's no place left to run. Then, as if he wanted to change the subject, he turned his back to, to us to stamp out the smoldering embers of the fireplace. That's when I saw that Gunner himself had run from something, and that something had followed him, leaving him restless and unsettled. I had seen it first in his dark, somber eyes, I had read it in his letters to Emmeline, and just then, as he stamped out the embers, I saw it most clearly in the thick, angry scars that marred his back. He had run from something, but it clung to him and would not let loose. Okay, we'll pick up tomorrow on chapter 21. Today I want you to make a prediction of what you think is going to ha happen in the next chapter, and then tomorrow we'll see if you're right.